was, and can I say, without the push of the library in the beginning, this big building would never be happening. Parks and Rec are going to be there as well. And they are, you know, they're always organizing things. They're a great force in our community. They're always there yes. for events. And, you know, they are always there. And, you know, we have to be thankful that we've got people who carry on because of and in spite of in Cobra. Yes. And that's the spirit of Cobra. Yes, it is. And Cobra was never considered as worthy of anything. And we have some of the best things, you know, now. And now we have these world class architects building our library and the building. And what is their name again? Uh, Perkins and Will. It used to be Freelon. Yes, Freelon, I... actually, Phil Freelon. Mm -hmm. And um, then they were taken over by Perkins and Will, which is a national company. And they have a, a parking unit in this company. So we have architects with a lot of parking experience. Oh, that's great. Which, uh, I mean, the town can take advantage of too. You know? Yes. So, but it's a very deep bench with a lot of local people and a lot of minorities and women. So it represents the community in which we live. That, that, so, that's so encouraging. And so yeah. this library will represent everybody who lives in Southern Orange, yeah. and which is diverse, and everybody, you know, is part of our community. It's an inclusive space. And it's, I love what you said about the, what quoting Clinton about the importance of libraries. I mean, that when I was growing up, we didn't have a lot of money. We didn't have a car for a long time, and. Uh, so the library, you know, in the summer, the hot summers, I take my little sister and brother, yeah. and we go and spend a morning in the library and bring home a lot of books, and that was that was our main. Yes. Well, you know, Mayor Lavelle entertainment. Is, yeah, well, Mayor Lavelle is doing story time for us in the Cobra Branch Library. For those of you who still live, you know, in Cobra and go to the library, don't forget the Cobra Branch Library is there, yes. and it has been there temporarily in the McDougal school media center for 24 years we just finished uh, the art program there i have run the art program there for 24 years and we have shown the work of 1500 artists there you've had yeah. wonderful yeah. exhibits yes. i go to the yes. car and we course. actually stopped doing that um, on june the 8th we handed over the walls we handed the walls back to the schools so that they can now take advantage of that whilst we're there and use our hanging system, which we may or may not take to the new space. We don't know yet, but we'd like to be part of helping them use the hanging system and um, using their space. They have their space for the first time in 24 years. They will be able to decide what goes on the walls of their media center. And we yeah. want to thank the school system for being such a good host. And yeah, they have a great art teacher because even though the uh, uh, the library uses the wall yeah. space in the library. Yeah. The school puts up wonderful stuff. Well, on the, the middle hallways. school and the uh, yeah, we have uh, two uh, art teachers. One in the middle school. They're one great. Is, yes, yeah. Kate Parent is in the um, middle school. You know, and we have Erin in the uh, elementary school. We're working with everybody, including both librarians. So we're still a family over there, and we'll be there for a while Definitely. still. So we, we're grateful to the Cobra Ch uh, Chapel Hill City Schools for hosting us for so long temporarily. Yes. They have benefited, let me tell you, but we also have benefited as a community from their generosity. Yes, yes and that leads us into another gift that you give to the community well, and all of us, and that is art. Well, you yes. are an artist yes. well, as yes. well as a community activist and I I think that you, uh, if I remember correctly, are um, working with Frank. Yes, I'm a, I'm a landscape artist, okay? And I've seen yes. some of your wonderful yeah, work, you. yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Laurie, for bringing that up. Yeah. I'm a landscape painter and I'm a member artist of Frank Gallery. Frank Gallery, for those of you who are not familiar with it, was originally at 109 Franklin Street down in Chapel Hill, four doors down from what used to be Spanky's. Okay. Uh, we moved a year and a half ago to University Place, formerly University Mall, to the 
uh, Tyndall Gallery, which was built by Chapel Hill's own Phil Shostak, who also built Deepak. Who, who so was it? Phil Shostak. Yeah. Oh, okay. So he designed Deepak. And so we're in a very beautiful space there. J Jane Tild Tyndall decided that she didn't want to have the gallery anymore, so it was offered to us. And it was an offer too good to turn down. So we left Franklin Street. We had very good uh, landlords there, the Michael and, Breda, and Laura Breda Arahi, who are philanthropists, as you know. And uh, we want to thank them for what they did for Frank Gallery. And they made it possible for us to function for nine years there. So we are now into our 10th year in University Place. And the new owners of University Place just renewed our contract. And we also have a second gallery there, because as you know, the mall is still quite empty. So we have another space called the Community Gallery there, which is Frank's monitored space. And in that space, we have um, community artists. So um, we just had the Triangle Visual um, Artists Group and then in two weeks' time, the Duke Hospital Arts for Life group will come in with a show for one month, and it's sponsored by Frank Gallery. We have a system whereby uh, artist groups pay, and then nonprofit groups like Arts for Life that do service. Yeah. They, uh, the, that so that's Art for Life. Yes. Uh, then Frank Gallery is able to support a number of artist group like Arts for Life and the PTAs and uh -huh. uh, our own Karen Newhart group and also um, UNC um, Advanced Photography. So there are some groups that we pay for. We also have quite a sizable uh, number of shows every year from uh, Orange County Artists Guild. They're the ones who do the studio tour and they just had a show in May and they'll be there from uh, the middle of uh, October until the end of the holiday. So they will have their studio tour preview. Then they will also have their own show. And we'll have one of our shows in October. It's called um, Frank in Focus. It's part of the Triangle White uh, Photography, Click Photography show. And Barbara Tyrone, one of our own artists at Frank, will be. Well, I recognize her name. Yeah. She's been around a yeah, while. She's too. a member of Artists at Frank Gallery. Well, she's taken a break, but she's still a member of Artists yeah. on the board. So um, basically, uh, we, and actually this Saturday, we have a little pop up outside Frank Gallery itself, you know, our main gallery, which is near the ice cream stand, close to the cinema, the Silver Spot Cinema. Uh, basically, we'll have a uh, 2 to 4 p.m. prequel, preview of what the Arts for Life volunteers do with their Duke Hospital patients. Aww. So everybody is welcome to come along and have a hands-on experience. So wait a minute, so that's this Saturday? Yes, from 2 to 4. From 2 be, to 4? Yes, yes. And it'll be outside Frank Gallery. Universally be, Place, so it'll be inside the mall, but yes, outside yes. the gallery. So it, is, it won't be hard, but you'll meet some of the wonderful people who work with Duke patients every day. They work a lot with children. Yeah. And what they do is they really divert their children from the, you know worrying about illness um, and they work with adults as well, with patients coming in who are a little tense before, you know, uh, an appointment or a treatment, and they involve them in art making. Whoever started that with hospital patients, yes. I think they have another group at UNC. At least yes. that seems. Like I think I think it's different. This group is also uh, involved in Asheville. But I think they're looking for uh, people to show an interest in their organization. They're, but they're going to have a show uh, showing um, some of the artwork in July in the community gallery, which they'll sell, which they hope the proceeds of which will go towards their project. Yeah. So we, we and Frank like to support that Absolutely. so that they can make a, a little bit of money yeah. to buy art supplies for their project. Yeah, know? and this whole... Yeah. You know, uh, art can be so healing to see it and to yes, do it. Yes. And and whoever started, and I, maybe it's been going on for, for decades, but started um, having hospital patients both with mental illness and physical illness, um, 
getting expressing art and some of the art is is just really terrific. Yeah, some of the art is, is terrific. Uh, and in fact, you know, there's also brushes with life, as you know, we have the psychiatry department. And we have had in Frank Gallery, we one of our um, in our former space in the, that community gallery, we have yeah. very significant brushes with life student there. And um, a very fine artist and Years ago, we had a Brushes with Life show in the Carver Branch Library, one of our shows, and one uh, we had two very significant pieces, and people traveled there from all over the East Coast because this person had shared a studio with Andy Warhol. Oh my goodness. And, uh, so, you know, mental illness has no boundaries. No, it doesn't. And so, you know, people have an idea that, you know, mental people with mental disabilities should be you know, sequestered somewhere, you know, it's throughout the community. And this artist was a significant artist, and I think his work is still in the Brush Through Life collection, which is a very interesting collection, which they keep, you know, and in the hospital. And to have one of Andy Warhol's uh, studio um, partners is really a valuable acquisition for the organization. Yeah, now Brushes for Life is at UNC? Yeah, it was the psychiatry department. The psychiatry I don't know department. really now how that is run. And the one you're going to have on Saturday is from Duke Hospital. It's, yeah, it's different. It's yeah, called Arts, for, Arts life. for Life and it's yeah. for all patients coming yes, in. Yes. And their show, as I said, will, will um, uh, from July the 2nd or July the 3rd till July the 30th, will feature um, photographs of what they do, but also artwork, which will be for sale. Okay. Um, and their docents will be there, um, manning the, uh, you know, the community gallery between, yeah. I think, one and five. So, we as a, you know, if you go on Frank Gallery website, uh, www.frankisart.com, but we need to know that Frank Gallery is also a fine arts gallery run by 22 member artists of different, uh, different, um, I wouldn't say persuasion skills. We have furniture makers, we have jewelry makers, we have woodworkers, ceramicists, painters and photographers, and others. And um, we also show the work in addition of other artists, guest artists. So we show about um, the work of close to 60 artists. And we change the collection every two months. So we just had an opening this last Friday. So um, the Arts for Life opening will be on July the 12th. So if you want to come and meet a lot of people all together, including some of the patients, that'll be from six to eight in the community gallery. But Frank is there uh, every day except Monday. Uh, we're open from uh, 10 till six, Tuesdays to Thursdays, Fridays and Saturdays, 11 till seven. Sundays 1 to 6. Um, and whilst I'm talking about Frank, um, I also run the Karen Youth Art Group. Um, these are refugees who come, uh, who came to this country from Burma from refugee camps. Um, so the, what is it called, the parent? It's the Karen. Oh, youth, the Karen. Yes, yes, it's the Frank Karen Youth Art Group. And we've been running this group now for over six and a half years. And basically what we do is we concentrate on um, working with Karen young people. The Karen culture, the Karens came originally from uh, the uplands of eastern Burma and they were one of the first groups to be uh, uh, burnt out of their villages by the Burmese mm. hunter before the Rohingyas. And they were fortunate enough, if you can say that, to be given shelter in Thailand. Uh, the king of Thailand, who is now dead, was very, very um, amenable to giving shelter to them because they actually lived on the Thai border, a lot of them. Oh, so the there were some Karens over in Thailand, so yeah. there was, you know, some affinity there. And so all the early students we had were born in refugee camps. We had some who were born in Burma who remembered being burnt out of their villages. Mm -hmm. One of those is one of our older students now. He's 24. He's been with us for six years. And I'm very pleased to say that in August, he will be a, a transfer student in fine and digital arts at UNC Greensboro. He has all his funding paid for, 
and he is going places. He's a wonderful artist. He's called Latu Bo, and he is um, somebody we're very proud of. Um, we wrote a book about the farm. I don't know if listeners know that the Karen community um, were also not only weavers with a great tradition of arts and art sensibility, but also farmers. So oh. they lost their land when they were thrown out of their villages. Coming here to Chapel Hill, they were fortunate enough to live near an agricultural area and Triangle Land Conservancy has given them eight acres to farm. And these eight acres sustain 38 families. And they also sell community supported agricultural boxes. Yes, friends of mine have yeah, shares I get, in yes, that. Yes, I have that too. I have a box every week during the season. Yes. And eggs, they have an egg problem. The eggs are second to none. So uh, our students, many of their parents, farm this farm. And so they wrote a bilingual book about the farm called uh, the, A Community Farm, The Story of Transplanting tradition, com Traditions Community Farm. And um, they illustrated this with photographs. They took drawings and also um, the story uh, was translated into Karen. It's a bilingual book and it's in many schools. I just want to come back and we'll yes. just talk about that a little bit more, but yes. it's time for a station break. This is Will Swake Up Call on WCOMLP, Chapel Hill and Carver. And especially with this hot weather, uh, our hearts and thoughts go out to farm workers uh, that are providing our food and they need support from the whole community for the appreciation for what they yes. do to keep food. And you'll be out on July the 4th as well. Right? And July, oh thank you for reminding me about that. Yes, July 4th, the Friends of Carborough. We're always next year. Yeah. Yes, and, and Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. We're always next to each yes. other under the trees. Yes. And uh, very glad to support Carborough and to let people know about uh, our, our organizations, the work that they're doing, and uh, so we look forward to any of you. And Carver, it's one of these uh, Fourth of July celebrations that it's hard to find anymore. It's a regular small town festival. Yeah, it really is, and you know, it's, it's basically, you can't put it into words how so many people in Carver know each other. Yes. And I think it's because everybody's a team here, and uh, we don't specialize in prima donnas. And I think that's really important I because everybody is. works towards the good of the town, and you know, everybody wants the town to have you know inclusive events, yes. and um, all of those things. Um, but getting back to you know, yes, I'm getting back to, to the art. I need to. Say uh, yes, I, I do want to yeah. leave the yeah. art, and yeah. I just want. Yeah, I need to uh, say some more things about the art because I've been doing a lot of work um, in climate change for a long, long time. And um, thank you for mentioning uh, that. Yes, you know, right. Yeah, uh, it, about ten years ago, or more than ten years ago, I went to the Antarctic. And uh, it's not an easy journey. Many of you, I'm sure, have been down there, and you have to go to South America. Probably you went through Argentina, and then it's a 44-hour journey on the high seas. And um, I went in an icebreaker, so that didn't have any stabilizers, so it was a little rough on the high seas. But once we get, got to the ice, it was good to be an icebreaker. But the place, the pristinity of that place is really important because that's really what has made the middle latitudes and the lower latitudes possible for so many people to survive in this world. Um, uh, the fact that so much of that area is really being affected now by climate change. And can I just say that the Guardian newspaper in Britain has upgraded its use of climate change to climate crisis. And I think that, that is an acceptable thing now. Many years ago, a lot of people would not let anybody use the word climate change. And um, now, the fact that the Guardian newspaper editorial will allow its um, people to use the word climate crisis does say speak to the fact 
that we've had some of the most devastating storms here in in the United States uh, over the last two or three years. Absolutely. I mean, and I mean, I know we all have had tornadoes. I mean, I have two giant trees. I had one across my uh, driveway in Hurricane Michael. We had people up 54 who were still digging out of a yes. tornado. And I'm not saying these never happened before, but everything is becoming more extreme. And we can call it whatever we want, weather, extreme weather, but things are changing. And I think there is some recognition of that. So then, after that, I did go to the Arctic, and I was part of a six-month-long UNC exhibit called Ice Counterpoint. Um, oh, what? Ice Counterpoint, yes. And so, um, basically, we looked at all the different uh, aspects of polar studies. And during that show, we targeted 18 schools for um, inclusion in the program by uh, environmental scientists from UNC, people also from uh, geophysics, and also uh, the law, how it affected uh, minority people in ice-dependent uh, ice areas, like the northern parts of Alaska, parts mm -hmm. of the United States and Canada. And so this became from a two-month show, they kept extending it because there was more to say. And it lasted for six months. And before that, I had done a six-month project with McDougal Middle School with Cape Pound. And all the students there had made um, objects, you know, uh, related. They, we made 44 penguins, full-size penguins to size. There are 17 kinds of penguins. And for everybody's information, the penguins are in Antarctica and the polar bears are in the Arctic, and everybody has to know the bears are up there and the penguins are down there. That's what you have to know. <laughs> but um, in addition to that, they made big, not life-size, but big bears, and we took all of those to the UNC Center, including a walrus, which was made, um, not to size, but pretty big. And um, as a result, there is now a polar studies department in the a global Education Center. They said that was one of the most significant shows they had. So I showed And I them, saw some of your paintings yes, from Yes, that. yes. Sure. I showed them with Brooks de West Smith, who's uh, in the music department, and also he he's retired now, a photographer. Mm -hmm. And um, he brought in musicians, and somebody composed a piece. Terry Mazesco from the symphony composed the piece. Then after that, I was included in a show called Vanishing Ice by Margaret Matilski, who was once the curator of the Ackland Art Museum. She has now since retired, but she moved to the West Coast. And uh, she had uh, an exhibit called a Vanishing Ice, uh, 70 artists involved in polar images. And that, I, that show started uh, up on the West Coast near Bellingham and worked with Vancouver and Seattle. And then it went down to uh, El Paso. It went from there to the Glenbow Museum in Calgary and finished off in the very prestigious um, McMichael Collection in Toronto, including a lot of paintings by the group of seven who had been some of the first environmental painters in Canada who had worked with First Nation people. Oh, uh, great. Uh, yeah. So, and they had footage of movies of these artists with them. In those two years, it took two years for the show to travel from one end of the nation, of the continent of North America to the other side, the climate had changed significantly. And at the very beginning of the show, the people in the Whatcom Museum in Bellingham, the docents were very nervous about how people would react to the exhibit and how could they talk to the people about the work. And I just said, just look at the art, you know, you don't have to have a point of view. If people see what is being lost, uh, what could be lost. In that show, we also had James Baylock, who made the movie uh, Chasing Ice, who talked about all the collapsing um, uh, glaciers in western Greenland. And he's also documenting the Antarctic now. So we had 70 of those. And I said, just look at the work. And they had these amazing time photographs of then and now. 
about a month after that, there was the mudslide in the Cascades from uh, a rainstorm they had never had before. And people up there even started to change. By the time we got to Texas, they hadn't had any rain or snow for five years. And um, there was a coastline. And so the law of the sea, which comes into play, uh, you can claim uh, uh, Norway, and I spent time actually painting up in Svalbard in the Norwegian Arctic, puts places like that and the wildlife up there, including the bears and also the walrus is at great risk. Um, the fact that all these areas now have much more open water throughout the year means that the bears and the walruses are really losing their habitat and it's very serious and um, they're even